one thing to, to note is we've asked Andrew to have a, a, a relatively uh, su short and succinct talk, pardon the pun, and uh, <laughs> and and because we we. we our, our attempt is to emulate the TED talks, the, the short talks, and then have a good, robust discussion following. And we'll we'll put the we'll we'll put the discussion on a, a, as a blog, so you can you know, try to capture that as well. And so when people watch the webcast, which we'll be doing, uh, they also can refer to the the discussion that we have afterwards. Um, so that'll be you know the style in which we do this. So let, let me introduce Professor Andrew Campbell. He's uh, based at uh, for the last year at Charles Darwin University, which is the top end of Australia in Darwin, um, which is always cool because it's a university and a town named after a scientist. How many places in the world uh, can you say that? Not only a scientist, a preeminent scientist. Uh, but Andrew's background is not in academia. He comes he comes to academia uh, through a really circuitous route, which is particularly interesting and, and I think one of the reasons why he's such an integrative thinker because he hasn't been in the academic department mentality like like most of us who've grown up in academia. So um, Andrew uh, worked in, in federal government uh, and in, in Australia based in Canberra, the capital, and in that role he did some really preeminent and important things like create this land care program which is over 20 years old now that, that really uh, mobilizes citizens and, and uh, uh, citizen groups, farmers, and, and the like to, to do better stewardship. So it's a really important uh, innovation in conservation. And um, also uh, worked at, at uh, Australia's Land and Water, uh, Land and Water Australia, which is a, a, a federal agency that, that does uh, uh, cross uh, cro continental level uh, decision making, and uh, currently uh, in his uh, role as chair of the Terrestrial Ecosystem Research Network (TERN), uh, it turns out Tern, Australia is smaller than the U.S. So TERN actually is like the LTR program, the Neon program, and the National Synthesis Center. So in his role at, as chair of TERN, he's got. Uh, a parallel kind of uh, organization. It's called the Australian ACES, Australian Center for Ecological Analysis and Synthesis, modeled after NCES in terms of the acronym, um, but much more like succinct in terms of the goals and objectives. So, so there's a lot of a uh, lot of synergies uh, with uh, what he's doing there, and so this is a great opportunity for us to to uh, discuss afterwards maybe some uh, collaborative opportunities between Australia and the U.S. in, in synthetic and integrative thinking. So um, we, we're really glad uh, Andrew could come here because uh, last night he gave a talk at the Australian Embassy with the Ambassadors Seminar Series. The Australian Ambassador was a former leader of the opposition, a very erudite and interesting guy, Kim Beasley, who put on, he's put on the series. So. So Andrew's been talking with NSF, and we, we met with uh, the CEO of um, the, the uh, Neon Network, the new uh, CEO there, and um, and and he's, he's talked with several eight other agencies. And then t tomorrow we're we're taking him down, or tonight we're taking him down to um, to our our lab and uh, MC's lab down in Cambridge, and he's going to talk with graduate students down there and visit our ongoing science communication course, which is occurring as we speak. Uh, so we're, we're, we're also interested in some long-term collaborative arrangements with Darwin Harbor, which is our Chesapeake Bay uh, uh, Australian equivalent. It's not a little harbor, it's a bay that's got lots of pressing environmental issues. So that'll be fun to see. So I don't think this is the last time you'll see Andrew. And one of his faculty are, is going to come do sabbatical here next fall. Um, so we'll be seeing more of these us visiting crazy Australians coming through, uh, thanks to Andrew's uh, leadership. So he currently is director at of the what's it REL stand for Research Institute for Environment and Livelihoods, which is really interesting group, and hopefully we'll, we'll have a chance to get into that. Long-winded introduction. Thanks, Andrew. Pleasure, Bill. Thank you. And I've just realised. Uh, 
to my chagrin that I've got the wrong title slide here, but I can show you it's the right talk. Uh, it's just that the title is, uh, is from last night's talk, but it is, it is the right talk. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for the invitation and, uh, and thanks for coming. I'm going to talk about uh, in, the, in what we call the big picture, climate, water, energy and food systems um, as big public policy challenges but also big science challenges and how we need to be treating them more holistically. And uh, I'm sure you would never have silo type approaches here in the US that it would all be extremely elegant and integrated but we do have some issues in Australia and uh, I'll be talking from that perspective and hopefully finishing up with a few ideas about how we could be working better together. But because I come from the top end of Australia, uh, uh, I was told you're not allowed to give a talk anywhere overseas without putting a croc in it. <laughs> so uh, these are our saltwater crocodiles. Uh, I grabbed this off the Twitter feed of one of our postdocs uh, the night before last. Uh, and uh, so field work is very different uh, when you realise that uh, you're just part of the food chain and not at the top. Uh, and so the field work forms that our guys fill out are somewhat different, I imagine, than some of, some of yours, uh, particularly people who are doing uh, mangrove ecology work in Darwin, Darwin Harbour. Um, so our context, uh, it, it, across the north of Australia, it's vast and at first glance it's empty. And so it's a very interesting context, incredibly unmodified by the standards of the more settled parts. Uh, and uh, we have a bit of what you would call ranching, but certainly no farming. Um, very, very intact coastline, the largest network of free-flowing rivers in the world. Uh, people who are living a pretty much a traditional lifestyle, uh, in some cases, um, uh, for 50,000 years or so, um, still you can still find uh, uh, elements of Aboriginal culture that are very strong indeed, and yet major resource development pressures, onshore, offshore, oil, gas, minerals, um, uh, massive projects. We have one project starting up that's going to pr produce 10% of Japan's energy needs, uh, so for over 40 years, so a very significant footprint. And, uh, and uh, as Bill reminded me last night, Darwin is actually closer to six Asian capitals than any other Australian city. Um, so it's a, it's a four hour flight for us to fly anywhere to an Australian city and, uh, and it's 40 minutes to Dili and two hours to Bali and, and, uh, and uh, three and a half or so to Singapore. So in our research institute, which as Bill said, environment and livelihoods, uh, uh, so we have sociologists and anthropologists as well as uh, wildlife biologists and, uh, and uh, physiologists and spatial scientists. So we deal with livelihoods, um, three broadly environmental programs, um, coastal and marine, freshwater and savanna ecology, and then uh, uh, have a small bunch of engineers working on renewable energy and build environment and, uh, and geospatial stuff. Yes. So I throw in another one. Um, uh, that guy's when we were on a family holiday and he's about one and a half times the size of our boat, so I thought uh, we might move on. Darwin Harbour in the extreme northwest of the continent, town of about 100,000 people, uh, tides of eight metres, so it's a 27 feet tidal range, um, and, uh, uh, and re in remarkably good condition so far. Uh, but it's about to have 12 million cubic metres dredged out of it to let these gas ships in and out. Um, and so at the moment if we still have 97% of the original mangrove communities, that's about to be changed um, substantially. Uh, and then who knows what will happen hydrologically. But we still have lots of people relying on this landscape for their, for their daily food intake. Um, uh, and living in fairly traditional ways. And we have a big challenge to wean ourselves off diesel energy, so renewable energy is a big priority for us. And one of the other characteristic things about doing science in the north is, is we're trying very hard in our institute to do research with Aboriginal people, not on Aboriginal people. And uh, working out how to blend 
uh, Western scientific knowledge with traditional knowledge is, is a very interesting uh, and very rewarding area of research. And yes, any undergrad or half-decent postgrad can go out and discover something new before lunch, pretty much. Um, uh, the, the biota, it's extremely rich, um, wonderful centre of, of biodiversity. And though we are seeing significant um, uh, impacts of climate change already, and uh, this is sea level rise, uh, is one of the things, the seas are warming very quickly over the northwest coast of Australia, and because you've got some large coastal floodplains that are low-lying, we're getting saltwater intrusion into some of our most uh, valuable freshwater wetlands already over very significant areas. Uh, so former Melaleuca wetlands that are um, now salinised. If you map a one metre inundation, uh, which if you think about it, eight millimetres a year for the last 20 years, so it's about six inches over that period. Uh, if you if you take that out uh, to a metre or so, there's about uh, there's well over a million people live in that red zone there in Papua New Guinea to the north of the slough. So we have the direct impacts of climate change, but also we have in in Australia as of one July we'll have a twenty three dollar a ton price on carbon emissions that will affect the the roughly one thousand biggest emitters. Anyone emitting more than twenty five thousand tons of carbon will be caught through this carbon price mechanism, which I believe is a game changer. We're not going to run out of fossil fuels, uh, but they're going to get more and more expensive to extract. And the moment you start putting a price on carbon, then the fossil fuels that are energetically inefficient um, fall out of the picture. So there's a thing called EROI, the Energy Return on Investment. In the 1930s in Texas, EROI was about 100 to 1. You used to use a, a barrel of oil to extract 100 barrels of oil. Worldwide now, it's down at about 14. It's the average worldwide. Car sands in Canada, 2. So you use a barrel of oil to get out 2. And obviously that equation can't continue in that direction forever. Um, water is similar. Um, we are Freshwater availability per capita is going down, but every calorie we consume roughly uses about a litre. Now obviously human, con human population's going up, consumption is going up, particularly the more you increase meat in the diet, the more the amount of water in the system, used in the system goes up. If you're in the centre aisles of the supermarket consuming processed foods, that's much more than one, one litre per calorie. Uh, if you're in the fresh food section, it's less. Uh, so it's not an even metric, but in aggregate it's held now since the Second World War. And water is expensive to move around. So because every, every litre weighs a kilogram, that means uh, a 1,000 litres is a tonne. And in Australia, the retail price of water in the home is less than $2 a tonne. Can you think of any other commodity you can have commodity uh, quality control delivered to your house for less than $2 a tonne. Um, so it's a, it's a very interesting commodity to think about the business that we have in shifting water around and that's what cities do and the energy involved is enormous. Um, so when you put all that together and couple it with population growth and changing consumption patterns, the world needs to increase food production by about 70%. That's a figure from the FAO, the Food and Agricultural Organization of the United Nations. That's been quite easy in the past. The, the humans have done that fairly quickly. But we've always done it by increasing agriculture's footprint. Clearing more land, cultivating more land, irrigating more land, uh, applying more nutrients, applying more energy. For the first time in human history, we're going to have to nearly double food production using less water less energy and less land, less nutrients. So that is an agricultural revolution. So here are our technical challenges. Decoupling economic growth from carbon emissions in a difficult climate, decoupling um, calories and litres, getting more food energy out per unit of energy we put into our system while making a shift to renewables. Trying to do all that without trashing what biodiversity is left in rural landscapes or rural communities. 
So I'm very worried that landscape amenity, uh, wildlife habitat and rural social uh, uh, communities will be caught in the crossfire of the squeeze between water, energy and food in a, car in a carbon constrained world. Um, and each of those is technically difficult. We have to do them all simultaneously. We have to do them all at the same time because there are a lot of feedback loops between them. I'm going to give you one quick example. Uh, so we're now in uh, southeastern Australia. Um, you can see the graph there on the uh, on the uh, down on the bottom um, and in uh, the Murrumbidgee irrigation area. A hundred year old irrigation area which traditionally has just had the dam up in the mountains and the channels of water coming down gravity fed and flowing out onto the, the fields to produce uh, all sorts of things. About a billion dollars on farm, seven billion off farm. But to save water and because we had a massive drought from the late 1990s through to um, nearly 2009, um, we've had to have a massive program of water reform to save water, which is understandable. But for Murrumbidgee irrigation, moving away from using gravity-fed open channels, which are quite leaky and evaporate a lot of water off, to all pipes and pumps has more than trebled their greenhouse gas emissions. And so this company is now one of Australia's big emitters. They've crossed the threshold into the 25,000 tonne a year emission. 25,000 tonnes, $23 a tonne, suddenly there's half a million dollars they're going to find that wasn't in their budget because there's now a price on carbon. Activities that emit carbon pollution now cost more money. Activities that save carbon pollution save money. There is a market signal rewarding better behaviour. So the board uh, contracted me to give them a hand saying, what the hell do we do about this? Um, and here were our, the solutions we came up with. Turns out they produce half a million tonnes a year in the big wineries, one of which is Casella's that does that yellowtail wine that you'd be familiar with, uh, that's currently just a waste stream. They can turn that into bioenergy. Uh, if the carbon price got to, we did um, marginal abatement cost curves for all these options against the carbon price. If the carbon price gets to $50 a tonne, it would actually be economic for them to cover all their remaining channels in solar panels and have a great big sol a spidery uh, solar power station, uh, but it's not at $23 a tonne. Converting all their plant uh, and pumps and so on to biodiesel made themselves by irrigating some canola and converting the seed to, to biodiesel. Rudolf Diesel, of course, invented his engine to run on peanut oil. It runs beautifully on vegetable oil. Uh, some carbon offsets through tree planting that was just as a buffer. In fact, we think we can catch all their emissions just through the top three. Uh, but also looking at second generation biofuels. When I say second generation biofuels, I'm talking woody cellulosics, not ethanol from corn. This stuff is 48 times more energetically efficient than ethanol from corn. Um, so a radically different proposition, not the same trade-off with food production. Essentially, what we came up with was going to turn a water company into a water, energy and carbon company. At the moment, the company sells water to its, to its shareholders, which are the farmers. In the future, it's going to be selling them water, energy, renewable energy and carbon offsets. So if they want, they'll be able to brand all their product as carbon neutral or carbon positive. And the company as a whole, the region as a whole, will be able to do the same thing. And here's the dashboard that we came up with for this strategy. So think about it, it's an irrigation company, it's owned by its members. The members are nearly all farmers. Uh, and in Griffith, they're mostly second and third and fourth generation Italian, Greek, Macedonian people. They sure don't like paying taxes. Uh, and they definitely didn't want to be paying this carbon tax. But they relate to... You know, this is the sort of stuff they deal with all the day. The, the we designed it to look like the dashboard of the tractor. And so you can see there in the middle, water system efficiency. Uh, top left, we've got uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Just like a tractor dashboard, there's a red zone and a green zone for most of the dials. There's a red dial for where we are now and a green dial for where we'd like to be. Biodiversity per hectare. Um, we've got... Uh, 
water system efficiency but also conveyance efficiency, uh, water quality, waste, energy produced versus energy consumed, the water efficiency per hectare of each of the crops, average in the region, and uh, some of their projects. The really interesting thing I like about this is they thought it was very important to, to measure how they're tracking with the community. So how many people are involved in our courses? How many school kids are we getting to? How many landholders are, are uh, understanding all of this? And finally, are we an attractive place to work? Staff happiness was the single most important metric for the board uh, in terms of the performance of the company. So that's what I call uh, making integration real. That's how the, the equation that these guys are trying to keep in balance. Um, so, sorry, that's some of the, during the uh, very bad bushfires in Victoria in uh, February 2009 that killed 175 people or so and destroyed uh, uh, a number of towns. Um, Simon Sharma, the historian, says that landscapes are where nature meets culture. And I, very, I like that phrase very much because it says very clearly that we're socially constructing the landscapes that we live in. Uh, and that therefore if you're trying to influence the way in which the countryside's managed, you've got to be able to engage with values, perceptions, aspirations, hopes, fears. That's the game you're in. Just coming up with a technical fix is not going to make much of a difference. Um, and the phrase ecological apartheid refers to the notion that you can just do conservation in national parks and reserves and that uh, you can do production everywhere else. Makes no sense at all, especially in Australia we're seeing that with climate change a lot of the national parks are going to turn out to be in the wrong place. Um, so we're going to have to do conservation everywhere. So I'll just finish up with, uh, uh, I won't go into this in detail right now, but as Bill said, with the Terrestrial Ecosystem Research Network we have a national architecture which essentially combines uh, what you have in NEON with your long-term ecological research sites and the synthesis centre. So the green boxes actually generate data through observation systems. The grey boxes are the, uh, are the synthesis capabilities, the overall portal, but also a modelling and scaling infrastructure and an environmental analysis and synthesis uh, infrastructure called ACES. But a bit like succinct, uh, we, we're very keen that we have the policy inside the tent, not something that happens after the science is done. And, uh, and through ACIUS, um, we have a mechanism where scientists generate some of the ideas we look at, but we kept 40% of the money to manage in a top-down way on big issues that affect policy. And, it, and this is why, because if we don't bring the community with us, uh, we're not going to make a difference in the long term. And, and for us, one of the really exciting things is how do we make a carbon market work for better landscape management now that from 1 July there will be a price on carbon. And referring back to my land care experience, the thing that I think unfortunately we've stopped investing in as much in Australia, and I think we're paying the penalty now, is the work in schools. Uh, and so in the early days of land care we had programs in all schools and that was incredibly important for increasing environmental literacy in the community. You don't just get to the kids, you get to their parents as well in a much more constructive way than telling them what they should be doing. So i like to finish by suggesting that um, the future isn't some place we're going to, we're making it every day with the decisions we take and the actions that we do. But uh, working out how to live more sustainably on a finite planet is the greatest challenge of our age. Climate, energy, water, food systems are interconnected they are intimately entwined with our health system. Uh, if we don't get the food system right, for the first time in human history now, we have, uh, we have more people who are too heavy than, uh, than we have people who are hungry. So the, the, the distribution of the of, uh, nutrients in the world is, is way out of whack. And we're potentially facing a generation that won't live as long as their parents. We have to be seeing this as all part of the same problem and uh, I think we have a lot in common across our two countries and a, and a great 
opportunity to work together to, uh, to do something about it. And uh, outfits like yours are crucial in identifying solutions and making them more widely available. And I uh, look forward very much to working with you on, uh, on this broad challenge. And uh, if you want to read more, uh, there's a bunch of publications there that, uh, that I've written over the last few years that talk about various aspects of this in much more detail. Thank you.